responsibility for court involved youth. So these are young people who are facing delinquency charges or who are in the child welfare system due to a care and protection complaint or a child requiring assistance complaint. We also um, train the statewide juvenile bar and provide technical assistance through our intake line. So while we only represent kids who are court involved, we also provide advice to families across the Commonwealth um, on matters of school discipline and special education. So in general, some background on the Massachusetts Department of Education and the process for filing a complaint with the Massachusetts Department of Education. So the process of filing a complaint about a school district with the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is not that well known and as a result is underutilized. It is a fairly simple process and can be extremely helpful in situations, including school discipline situations. It is one of the few ways to take a school discipline issue outside of your home school district and get a uninvolved person to really look at the situation. It can also lead to some systemic change within school districts. So we really encourage folks to be thinking about whether or not their students are facing any type of situation that may warrant a complaint with the Department of Education. So what is the problem resolution system? So within the Department of Education, which oversees all education agencies across the state, school districts, public school districts, um, charter schools, vocational schools, private special education schools, they have this system called the problem resolution system. So it is an office, it is a program under the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And it manages complaints coming from families about failures of their school or their school district to comply with the law. So, um, the complaint management system. So the State Department of Education is responsible for monitoring all school districts across the, the Commonwealth. The problem resolution system office is focused on this complaint management piece. Um, and the problem resolution system office is the unit within the DESE that manages the system for receiving and resolving complaints of non-compliance with laws and regulations. The process for filing a complaint with this system requires that it be filed in writing if you are already at the Bureau of Special Education Appeals, you cannot file a complaint on the same topic with PRS. And we will get into that a little bit more when Elizabeth McIntyre shows up what filing a complaint with the BSEA means, but it's just something to note. Um, a complaint can be filed by anybody. So you can file it on behalf of your own child or another student or you could file it on behalf of a neighbor's child if the neighbor wants a little bit of help, but you must do it with that permission from the neighbor's parents. Um, and then I have included on the slide the website where you can go to file these complaints. And I don't think I've seen any questions thus far, but if there are any questions, Okay, so when to use the PRS system. It can be a little bit confusing to think about when to use which processes to deal with an issue you're having with your school or with your school district. So today we are obviously focusing on two of them. One is the one I'm talking about, the problem resolution system, and the other is the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. The time when it's useful to use the problem resolution system is when there are general education issues if you have a student who has been disciplined, meaning they were suspended from school, they were expelled from school, or even if they were pulled out of class for extended periods of time, this is a really good process for dealing with those types of situations. It is also a good process to use if there are special education violations of the regulations within the past year. So it's not so much gonna help if there's an issue of is the setting and the services providing your child with a free appropriate public education, which they are entitled to. It's more useful for dealing with things like failure to comply with timelines. So if the school district did not do a annual review on time, or the school district did not do the three-year evaluation on time, those are the useful things to go to the PRS system with. 
I think I saw some hands raised, but if folks could put any questions they have in the chat, that would be great. Um, so some examples of issues that you can bring to the problem resolution system are bullying, again, discipline procedural violations, um, McKinney, Vento, and foster care school stability issues. So if you and your family are experiencing homelessness and you're having issues with your school district enrolling your student or providing transportation to their school, or if you have a child who is in a group home through the Department of Children and Families and they're having issues, these are topics that can go to the Department of Education through the problem resolution system. And again, you can also bring special education procedural violations. And I just saw a question that said, would you share a real case scenario and how it was resolved? And yes, I will. I will get to that um, shortly. So thank you for that question. There are some limitations to the problem resolution system. So um, they do not have the authority to review a factual basis for a determination of disciplinary consequences. So if you had a child who was suspended from school and you felt like the suspension was wrong because it was not an appropriate action in response to your child's behavior or your student's behavior, the problem resolution system is not really going to address that issue. And I'm actually going to give an example about what that looks like um, shortly. And that is one of the challenges with PRS. But if there are procedural violations of your child's disciplinary due process rights, so access to a hearing, chance to share their side of the story, things like that, those processes um, can be addressed through the PRS system. It's also important to know that the process can take a long time. The average time is 60 days. It can take two to three months if they request an extension. So it's not necessarily going to address the immediate issue. But it can put pressure on the district and gain attention for them to any issues. So they may start correcting those issues. So one of the things you can ask for in a PRS decision is that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education required the school district to conduct a, to fix the issue. So for example, I'm gonna use discipline again. If a school did not hold a hearing before suspending a child, and that is something that you raise, you can ask the school district to require that the school conduct a review with all of their staff on school discipline law so that these things don't happen in the future. The process can also provide an after the fact remedy. For example, expunging your child's disciplinary record or providing compensatory educational services if your child missed out on special education services due to failure to comply with a timeline, for example. And it can also help future students. So this is something where it is really helpful to put every possible issue into the complaint and see what you can get. All right, so that was, okay. That was a lot of information. So I wanna pause for a second and address some of the questions that have come up. Um, so an example that we have experienced in a case um, that I worked on that I think really gets at some of what PRS can do is I had a client who was accused of assaulting school staff because she was annoyed with a teacher for getting in her face and she sort of went like this and the teacher claimed that she hit her and she was expelled from school. So we were able to file a complaint with PRS and get that overturned, but we got it overturned because the school did not comply with the procedures. So they didn't hold a hearing the first time and then they held, so they held a, they didn't hold a hearing at first, they sent her home without a hearing. They held a short-term suspension hearing. They held a second ex expulsion hearing. She was expelled. They failed to give her work. There were all these sort of procedural violations that happened that the school district, um, that due to those failures, her record was then expunged. The frustrating thing is that because they don't review the factual issues, 
the fact that she should have never been expelled for such a minor situation, which at worst could be qualified as being rude to a teacher, wasn't something they were able to address. So that's sort of an example of the pros and cons of the system. Um, okay, so how long will it take for the case to be properly viewed? Um, it, the average, it's supposed to take about 60 days. So they have 60 days to respond and I will go through shortly what the process is. Is there an appeal of a PRS decision? So no, there is no formal way to appeal a PRS decision. Um, but there may be other avenues that are gonna be a better way for dealing with your specific issue, such as the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. So that's um, not a great answer. The short answer is no, but the secondary answer is maybe there is another avenue. And I am going to provide the contact information for both the Ed Law Project as well as Greater Boston Legal Services at the end. So if you are having issues, you are welcome to call our intake line and speak to a um, staff member from one of our offices. I would also note for all those who are uh, most comfortable in a language other than English that while, at least at the Ed Law Project, we have some folks who speak Spanish. We don't necessarily have language capacity across the board, but we do have access to a language line that has interpreters who speak all sorts of different languages. So we can definitely, um, figure out a time to schedule with you to get a translator on the line to speak about any issues. So I don't want that to be a, to give anyone pause in calling. Um, does a parent need to try to solve it with the school personnel first, or can you go straight to filing a complaint? That's a really good question. So when you file a complaint, they ask you to um, state what steps you have taken with the school to try and resolve the issue. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take those steps, but it definitely helps the strength of your complaint if you can say we reached out and raised these concerns with the school and did not get a response. I know that often when you reach out to a school, there's um, a time lag between a response and when you reach out in a lot of situations, not always, but in a lot of situations. So it's not unreasonable also to say we reached out, I waited, four days, got no response, and now I'm filing this complaint. And then you can say that you reached out. Um, if you think there is racism involved in the school discipline action, then you can definitely raise that in the complaint. I'm not sure how much you're going to actually get with PRS because they often only look at procedural violations. On the other hand, I have been able to raise racism um, the people will go through who is looking at these complaints and how this works. The people looking at these complaints are swayed by the facts sometimes. So for example, in the case that I was just describing, the young woman who I represented was a black woman and there was definitely racism involved in what was going on with her. And while that wasn't the reason her expulsion got overturned, we were able to include that information and even included some data on the discipline of women of color young girls of color. And I think that was based on some conversations I had with the PRS specialist. It definitely was a factor in how they looked at the complaint. Um, and there may be that, you know, the Office of Civil Rights, which we could talk about maybe another time or other avenues would be a better way to deal with a racial bias issue. Um, when your child has an ed plan, in one or two subjects, isn't it right of the school to appeal services across the board with all subjects? Um, so that was a question from Carlene and Carlene, I think I might need a little bit more information. So I think what I'm gonna say to you is, um, we, I would encourage you to call our intake line on Monday and we'll have somebody follow up with you about that issue for your child and see um, what's going on in more detail. What are actions taken with the child or staff during the 60 days or so in a PRS issue? That's a great, great question. And I'm gonna get into the process very soon. Um, if the school gets the police involved, can you still file a complaint and what are your rights? Um, sorry, I think I just saw something from Roxy and I'm not sure what it was. So regarding the police getting involved, it's a really good question. There is, 
uh, there are agreements between school districts and the school police that govern when they can get the police involved and when they can't. Um, it is a little bit tricky because you're going to need to argue that they violated those agreements in getting the school police involved. That said, if that is something that you are experiencing, please call our intake line because this is actually what we specialize in are situations where kids end up being referred to the police for school-based behavior. And it's a very big concern and there are a number of different steps that you can take that may not be as straightforward as a PRS decision. Um, so that's what I would encourage if, if that's a situation that you are running into because it, it is an unfortunate um, that it happens. So Roxy, did you want me to try and answer Carlene's um, question live? Was that something that I saw? Um, we can unmute Carlene if, you, if it would help if she, if the question needs a little bit more cl clarification or is it that it, it would be too detailed to be able to answer? It might be too detailed to be able to answer because I'm not sure. So if she has an IEP that's only focused on two subjects, there's just a lot of nitty gritty information I may need from her about what the ed plan looks like and what is going on with her child that I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so I would ask to the general question because when I read it, it's kind of like when you have an IEP and let's say I have an IEP for reading and math services that mm -hmm. have various accommodations. Right. Should the school be applying those accommodations and modifications across all subjects such as history, science, and in all areas, maybe even gym class if there's a certain modification of additional prompts? Is it only allowed to be focused on okay. the subjects of school or should they be applying it throughout the school day? So the, the annoying lawyer answer that I'm going to give is that it depends a little bit, but generally my answer would be Yes. Um, so if you, I know most of you have child children on IEPs, so you've spent time looking at IEPs. If you look at the accommodations section of an IEP, which is usually in those sort of present levels of educational performance A and present levels of educational performance B components of the IEP, um, they should indicate in what areas the student needs these accommodations to access the curriculum. And even if they're only receiving specialized instruction in math and reading, it may be that those accommodations should apply in every single class. And I would argue for 99% of kids, that is the case. Um, Liz, I'm just gonna pause because yeah. I do have a note from our interpreters that we need to slow down so that okay. our interpreters can continue to um, translate. So I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. Thank you, Roxy. And Liz, I um, just wanted to let um, everyone know that the Cape Verdean interpreter has joined and we have placed the Cape Verdean interpreter into the Korean channel. Great. So the short answer is um, that in for most kids, I think it is often the case that the accommodations are going to be necessary in other subjects, uh, particularly um, with reading needs, because most classes involve, if not every single class, except for maybe arguably gym, involves reading. Um, however, if the IEP is written to exclude that, technically, the school does not need to provide those accommodations. So that is a conversation to have with your team that it is not enough to just provide support in English and math or in reading and math, but that these accommodations need to be provided in every single subject. So I'm sorry if that's a little bit of a frustrating answer, but if this is an issue you are running into and you have talked to the school about providing accommodations in every single class and they are continuing to say no, then that is really potentially a good issue for the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. And I would really encourage you to call the Ed Law Project or call Greater Boston Legal Services to talk more about what your options are and the details of what is going on. Um, okay. I hope that answered your question. 
So I'm going to keep going and then I will pause in another few slides to answer any more questions that might come up. Okay, so the, I want to get a little bit into what the actual process of filing a PRS complete complaint looks like. So every school district is assigned a PRS specialist. There are eight specialists for the state and two supervisors. And you can look up your specialist on the DESE website, which I have listed here. The PRS specialist reviews every single complaint that comes to PRS about their school district. So there is one specialist who looks at every single complaint about Boston Public Schools, for example, which can be very helpful because they know what's happening and they know what issues are continuing to come up. So um, here is a little bit more about the process for filing a complaint. So the first step we would encourage you to take is to contact the PRS specialist for your district to discuss the situation. So Boston specialist is a woman named Stacy Hayes, and you can call her. Her phone number is listed on Desi's website, and she may give you advice on your complaint, how to file it, if there are issues that she sees. You can talk to her by phone. A complaint can be opened by phone, but it must be followed up in writing with a completed intake form, which we're gonna get into in a little bit more detail. But that's really important to remember because even if you call her and tell her in detail what is going on, it isn't gonna be counted as a formal complaint until something is submitted in writing. Again, anyone can file. But if you're going to file on behalf of another family, you must make sure the family is in agreement and has given you written permission to file the complaint on their behalf. You can also file a complaint on behalf of a group. You can say that every single child at my school in need of certain services is being denied those services. And it is a really helpful way to flag an issue for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. There is also more information on the PRS website about how to go through this process. So we just wanted to put up the website for you in these slides, um, which I can provide to Roxy so that you can look at the more information on how to use the guide. And the guide on the DESI website is translated into a bunch of different languages as well. Okay. So after you have filed a complaint, and again, I'll get into what the actual form looks like in a little bit, the system, it's sometimes referred to as PQA as well as PRS, um, contacts the school district. So they will go to your child's school and say, hey, we got this complaint. Um, what is your response? And the school gets to file a response called a local report. The specialist, so Stacy Hayes, for most of the folks on this call, since she is Boston specialist, will send you a copy of the response from your child's school, and you can respond again. So if they say things that you disagree with, if they say things that you think that are factually inaccurate and you can want to submit a letter or a text message or some information supporting your side of the story, you can do that. Um, Really at any point in the process, you can send additional written materials and share more info, either by email or by phone with the PRS specialist. After the PRS system has collected all of the information, so your complaint, the school's response, and then your response to the complaint, um, they will issue a decision. If they find, and they will say that the school district has either been non-compliant or compliant with state law. They are required to issue the decision within 60 calendar days of receipt of your complaint. Depending on what's going on, they may ask for more time, but you can say no. It's really up to you. They are, their timeline that they are supposed to comply with by law is 60 days. If they find that the school district was non-compliant, meaning that they broke state law, then they can order that the school conduct corrective action. And um, the school needs to 
provide, so what I have written on the slide is correct and action outline and report must be prepared. So what this means is the school has to conduct corrective action. So this can be everything from expunging your child's disciplinary record to reviewing state discipline laws with all of their staff to providing compensatory reading services because of failure to conduct an evaluation in a timely manner, et cetera. And the school must provide the Department of Ed with a timeline for when they are gonna do these things and prepare a report. It is helpful to stay in touch with the PRS specialist if the problem is not fixed because they are then monitoring whether or not the school district has actually taken the corrective action that they are required to take. All right, I'm gonna check real quick to make sure. Okay. Okay, so I see some more questions. Carlene, I'm gonna, um, what I'm gonna do is um, encourage you to call the intake line. We normally get back to people within 24 hours and I usually return the calls from Boston. So we, you and I can chat more about the details of what's going on with your child. Okay. So, so that's the process. Um, I didn't see any more questions about the actual process. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some resources that we have put together. Um, and then if there are any other questions, I'll answer it at the end before um, passing on the presentation platform to Elizabeth McIntyre from Greater Boston Legal Services. So some, of, some useful tools that may help in filing your complaint um, include some templates that we have actually very recently put up on our website. So we're hoping to have templates that can help parents who are trying to address school discipline issues, bullying, special education procedural violations, COVID-19 issues, um, and web-based disciplinary issues. So this is the website where you can see those templates. It's still a work in progress, but we wanted to flag for you a little bit that this is gonna be available very soon. Um, it includes some detailed information about how to file a complaint. So if you are filing the complaint in English, there is an online version of how to file the, of where to file the complaint. So if you go to the DESI website, which was on that first slide that I will make sure Roxy has and can share with folks, um, there is a link to an online form. If you need any language other than English, there are paper forms that you can fill out an email in or mail in whatever is most comfortable um, to the problem resolution system. Um, so on the website, we have general instructions on how to use the templates as well as the templates themselves. And I just wanna go through real quick a little bit about the templates because I think they will be helpful for folks um, as they're thinking about these issues and if and how to file a complaint. So um, this is an example of a situation where a student may not have gotten proper notice before they were suspended of a suspension hearing. So if you looked at the templates that we have put up, you would see a page that says the school principal has to tell you or the parent guardian if the parent guardian isn't filling out the complaint when they are thinking about suspending the student. The communication with you about the potential suspension is called notice. Below is the list of steps the school must take before holding a suspension hearing. Check off everything the school did. And then it lists what the school is required to do by law. So the school has to give oral notice to the parent guardian, meaning they, or guardian, meaning they have to speak with you over the phone or in person about the hearing. The school also has to give written notice to the parent or guardian, meaning they have to send a letter or an email home about the hearing. The letter or email has to be in English and in your primary language if your primary language is not English. So if the school did not do any of those things, so if any of the boxes are unchecked, then the school didn't follow all of the requirements and you should include the following language in the brief statements of concern sections of your complaint. And then what we've done is provided a sentence that you can put into the complaint itself to say this is how the school broke the law. In this case, 
the sentence is, oops, the school district did not properly communicate with the student and the student's parent slash guardian regarding the student's discipline and is therefore in violation of 603 CMR 53.06. And then it encourages you to describe what requirements the school didn't follow. So that's a tool that may be available. Unfortunately, it is currently only in English, but we are hoping to translate it into a number of different languages. Um, okay. So I wanted to put out there the guides because it's a useful tool, but it may be that your situation doesn't fit perfectly. Or it may be that your situation is better addressed at the Bureau of Special Education Appeals or through the Office of Civil Rights. And if you're not sure or have any questions, please give us a call. So I've included on this slide both the Ed Law Project's intake line and Greater Boston Legal Services intake line um, so that folks can reach out if they have any questions about their individual situation. Okay, so um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any questions right now. Um, Liz, one thing I will say that, um put in the Q&A, but I yeah. see that is the question was asked, is it a conflict for the DESI rep to have a child in the district that she is um, handling? That's a really interesting question. I think there would be a really good argument that it could be a conflict because it disincentivizes her to um, take action against the school if she's worried about maintaining that relationship. So I, I, I think there's an argument there that that may be the case. I'm curious if, if there is somebody who has an insight into whether or not that is true of, of Ms. Hayes. Um, I would be very interested in talking about that. But I, I think there's a strong argument that it is a conflict. Um, so I don't see any more questions right now. I hope that was helpful. Um, I believe Elizabeth McIntyre from Greater Boston Legal Services has joined. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, great. And I'm gonna pass it off to her. Thanks everybody. Thanks Elizabeth. Um, hi everyone, it's so good to I'm sad that we're not in person, so I just see everyone's um, black squares here, but I am going to be talking about um, the uh, another dispute resolution system, the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. So I'm going to start sharing my screen here in one second. Um, Roxy, I'm not seeing an option to share my screen. Okay, give me one second to make sure um, Charlie will make you a co-host so that you have that ability. Okay, cool. Oh wait, it just appeared. Just appeared. Okay. So, let me actually just do this here. Okay. All right, so um, can everybody see my screen okay? Just some, looks like, yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So um, we're gonna talk about the Bureau of Special Education Appeals, the BSEA. I'm sure some of you have heard of the BSEA. Um, an important thing to know about the BSEA at the beginning is that unlike PRS, um, the BSEA can only answer special education questions. So at the end of her presentation, Elizabeth gave an example about filing a PRS complaint when there was a school discipline problem, when a parent wasn't told about a suspension that was happening. That's not something you can bring to the BSEA. It's just about special education. So, um, Here's what I'm gonna try and cover over the next uh, couple, over the next half an hour or so. 
I'll pause after slides so we can make sure that we answer any questions. I'm gonna start with just what is the BSEA? Why does it exist? What is it, what's the deal? We're gonna talk about what does the BSEA do? Um, we're gonna talk about mediations, hearings, and then we'll take any additional questions at the end. And I'm actually gonna move that there so that I can see it. Okay. So I'm gonna start with just what is the BSEA? So the BSEA is what we call an administrative law body. Basically what that means is that typically, if you have a disagreement with someone, you can, and the disagreement is a legal one, you can just go to court, you can sue someone in court. But um, judges don't like work. And so there are some situations in which the law says that before you can go to court, you have to go to kind of what I sometimes call fake court first. You have to go to fake court before you can go to real court. So the idea, the way the BSEA functions as sort of fake court is that it's much less formal than real court. So we don't call, there aren't really judges, there are hearing officers. Um, we don't have, you know, there aren't really sort of rules of evidence, you know, like in sort of TV court, you might see folks object to things. There's not really real rules of evidence with the BSEA. Um, it happens, BSEA hearings happen around a conference table. Now they happen over Zoom, but in the pre-pandemic life, they happen around a conference table, not in a courtroom. So it's sort of much less formal. So that means that in the special education world, if you and your school disagree about something related to special education, related to a student's IEP, before you go to court, you have to go through the BSEA. The BSEA does basically three things. The first is mediations. This is not a hearing. It's not like court at all. A mediation is what it sounds like. You have a group of folks who are going to bring you and the school together. They're called mediators. And the mediators try to resolve the dispute between you and the school without going to a hearing. This is, uh, you know, typically this doesn't involve lawyers. Usually it is when there's some space for compromise. We'll talk more about what mediations look like in a little bit, but that's the first thing they do, mediations. The second are hearings. This is like a fake trial. Um, hearings, typically there are lawyers. It's often unfortunately challenging to win if you don't have an attorney or an advocate. Hearings, there are opening and closing statements, there are witnesses, you're sworn in, um, they're sort of, they, they feel sort of like a mini trial. And then the last thing that the BSEA does are what we call settlement conferences. A settlement conference typically only happens when both parties, so you and the school, have an attorney or an advocate, and somebody has requested a hearing, but we haven't gotten to the hearing yet, and a settlement conference is like a mediation in that it brings both parties together and you try and figure out a solution. But the differences are that a settlement conference is only with attorneys and it's after somebody's asked for a hearing. Then there are sort of three groups of people that work at the BSEA. The first are mediators, they handle these mediations. There are hearing officers, they're sort of like judges for the hearings. And then there is the director of the BSEA. Her name is Reese Ehrlichman. And Reese, as the director, what she does is she does all the settlement conferences. That's, her, that's part of her job. So I think we have two questions, though they are sort of cut off. Let me see if I can move this. There we go, okay. So we have two questions. Um, the first is, what is the difference in services provided by the BSEA and PRS? Yeah, good question. So the BSEA is only going to resolve disputes for you um, when they involve special education. Whereas with PRS, 
they can handle any education related dispute. So with PRS, you could have a complaint about a child being restrained and you could take that to PRS. You could have a complaint about a child being illegally suspended. You could take that to PRS. You could not take it to the BSEA. The BSEA is only special education. The other difference is that the BSEA and PRS are, you know, PRS has no hearing. There's no sort of fake trial. Um, PRS, everything just happens over paper. PRS also takes, most of the time, PRS is gonna be faster than the BSEA. Not always, but most of the time it's gonna be faster. And then the third thing is that if you lose at PRS, there's really no sort of way to appeal that. If you lose, you lose. But if you lose at the BSEA, you can appeal that into court. So those are some of the big differences. Um, the next question is that notes that Greater Boston Legal Services, we are a nonprofit. We do a lot of cases, that's true. Um, and how long will it take for parents to file with the BSEA with GBLS to sort of start that process? How long does that take? Um, we are gonna talk about timelines in a little bit, but the, the short answer is it depends. So sometimes there's an emergency, like a student um, suddenly has been kicked out of school and has no school. That's an emergency. We're gonna be filing with the BSEA very, very quickly. Other times it's about the student's placement isn't going well, and then that might be a little bit more time. Our contact info is at the end. Um, if you call and you're not a current client, we will call you back within two business days. So that's my promise to you is if you call us, we'll get back to you within two business days and then take it from there. And then the last question we have so far is when does SpedEx come in? Good question. SpedEx, I will tell you, I have never used SpedEx. Um, I think most lawyers typically don't because I personally haven't heard it to be very helpful. Um, but I will say that basically SpedEx is another kind of function that the BSEA does. They offer, it's another dispute resolution process that is like mediation. You can request SpedEx, though I do not have the contact information about how to request that sort of, um, that process right in front of me, but I will get it to Roxy and get it to folks. I will say that personally, I've not found it to be helpful, but I will be interested to hear if anyone has used FedEx and found it to be helpful. Um, the next question is who are mediators? What are their credentials? What's their deal? Yeah, mediators are sometimes lawyers. They're not volunteers. They are fully paid, um, Full, they're full employees. They're paid by the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. So they're state employees. That means they do not work for the district. They work for the state. They are neutral. I will say that the, the person, the me a mediator who often handles Boston cases is a woman named Leslie Bach. Um, I found her to be relatively reasonable and fairly helpful. So um, she's a former lawyer who used to represent parents. Um, now she's a mediator. So that's, that's really who they are. Typically lawyers, but not always. They're definitely not volunteers. They're state employees. Um, and then lastly, we have a question from Carlene who asks, if your child has an ed plan in one or two subjects, um, shouldn't the school apply those services across the board? Um, it's a good question. I heard Elizabeth Levitan uh, take a stab at answering this question a little bit earlier. You know, unfortunately, the very irritating answer is it depends. Um, I'm going to say most of the time, yes. Sometimes it might be the case that a child, you know, has a particular, uh, like, for example, I had a client who um, did really, really well in math but really struggled with um, reading and sort of comprehending written language and would become very, very upset um, in English and language arts sometimes in ELA. So one of the accommodations that she needed is she needed a number of check-ins specifically during ELA 
to make sure that she was okay. So in that situation, those are ELA specific accommodations. Other times, um, kids need it across all of the subjects. So it's really gonna depend on the child's specific IEP. Okay, I think that is all of the questions that we have right now. So we will, now that we've talked about what the BSEA is, we're gonna jump right into talking about mediation. So first let's talk about sort of mediation cases when you might go to mediation. Remember we talked about, or I said with the BSEA, you know, we're only talking about special education. We're not talking about other education cases. So the first kind of mediation case you might want is that it, when a student isn't getting services in their IEP. So one of these might be, um, let's say for example, Carlene's example earlier, if you have a child who is supposed to be getting accommodations across every subject and they're not getting them, uh, that would be a potential mediation case. If a student is supposed to get physical therapy and they haven't been getting that because it's a pandemic or because the physical therapist is on paternity leave or something like that. Or maybe your student moved into Boston and Boston said, well, they have this service in their IEP, but we're just not gonna provide that. That's sort of the first category of cases. The service is in the student's IEP and the district is not following it. The next type of case is a disagreement over what services should go in to the IEP. So this is the kind of case where you say, I think my child needs physical therapy and the school won't put it in their IEP. Or I think my child needs a smaller classroom. Or I think my child should be in an inclusion classroom. Or I think my child needs a one-to-one -one aid, something like that. Um, in all of those cases, that's a disagreement over what services should go into the IEP. A next uh, potential mediation case is a disagreement about placements. So for example, um, let's say that you have a child who is in a smaller classroom and you think that they could do well in an inclusion classroom. Or let's say you've got a child at McKinley who's having a tough time and you think they need an out of district placement at a private school. Or maybe you think your child needs a residential school. Those would all be placement disagreements. And then lastly, I wanna mention compensatory education. Um, we don't have time today to get into everything that the pandemic did to our kids. Um, but I want to just note that another kind of case that you could bring to a mediation is where a child has been really deprived of services and now the child needs something to compensate them, to make up for the kid not getting all of those services. And we've got some questions, so I'm gonna pause there and answer a couple of, answer a couple of these. So the first is, um, what's the first step when you're looking for a change in placement like out of district? Uh, I'm gonna leave that question up there because we're gonna get there. The next one is, if a student requires accommodations in reading, should parents ask that it is a targeted reading accommodation across all subjects to ensure it applies in all areas? Yes, so if your child has a particular need for a particular accommodation in reading um, because of reading is challenging for them, then what I would suggest is there's a page in a student's IEP um, where it lists a bunch of subject areas. This is called, lawyers and advocates call it PLEP A, but it stands for Present Levels of Educational Performance A. So if you look at an IEP and you flip to the page that says present levels of educational performance A, and then you'll see a bunch of subjects written there. And then below that, what you'll see is what accommodations a child might need. So if your child is struggling with reading and therefore needs a reading accommodation across all subjects, not just ELA, 
then you want to make sure that all of the subjects that the child needs that accommodation in are checked off at the top. And then sometimes I've even said, um, you know, to specifically written where the accommodations are to say needs, let's say check-ins, whenever engaging in reading in any subject or something like that. You really shouldn't need to say that as long as all the boxes are checked off. You should just be able to say needs check-in while reading at particular points, um, but it can't hurt if you really wanna make sure it goes across every subject. Um, the next question is, can you explain the difference between placement and location? Um, sure. So a placement, a special education placement, refers to the type of classroom and type of school that a child is in. So I'm sure some of you know this, so I hope you'll just bear with me while I explain. But basically, there are a number of types of classrooms that a student with a disability can be placed in. So on the one end, you have general education classrooms. So, you know, 25 students and a teacher. Then you have sort of a step up from that, which Boston sometimes calls these inclusion classrooms. And sometimes Boston says inclusion and they mean all kinds of things. But for our purposes, you know, let's say a good inclusion classroom is fewer students around 15, and it's co-taught with a general education and a special education teacher. Then you have a step up from that, um, which is a substantially separate classroom. So substantially separate classroom is way fewer kids, no more than 12 at the absolute most. Um, they're all kids with disabilities, usually in Boston, the same type of disability. And that class is also, usually there's a special education teacher and a paraprofessional or teacher's aide, sometimes two teacher's aides. Then you have a step up from that, which are day schools. These are schools where all the students in them have disabilities. So sometimes these are run by school districts. In Boston, this is places like McKinley. Sometimes these are run by private nonprofits. So those are places like the Italian Home or the May Center, Landmark, and so on. So those are all these different categories of placement. All those categories of pl placement are different from the actual school that your child is attending. So we could see having a, you could have a substantially separate classroom at the Mattahunt Elementary, you could have a substantially separate classroom at the Ellis Elementary, and a student could be in a substantially separate classroom in either of those places. So those are two different locations, but the same type of placement. And actually, in like two weeks, I'm coming back to SpedPAC to do a whole presentation just about like Special Ed 101, and we will go even deeper into sort of what placements mean and how all that works. So if it doesn't make sense to you, I encourage you to come back. I think it's the 29th. Um, okay. And then we have a question. Are in-home services an option to help bridge the gap from on-site to remote learning? Would a parent go through the BSEA to request this accommodation? This is a great question. I sort of feel like I need we would need a whole nother hour to really talk about the remote learning issues um, and what all of that means. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So we've got a couple of questions here that are about that are about the pandemic, which makes sense because that's what we're all dealing with right now. Um, but they're about the pandemic and about problems that have happened during the pandemic. I don't have time to talk about all of the problems that happened during the pandemic and this. Roxy, Charlie, would you prefer that I keep going on this or do you, would you prefer that I answer some of the pandemic related questions here? I'd like you to address some of the pandemic questions and we'll get back okay. to this just because there's several. Okay, and with a reminder good. that you're right, on October 29th, we will definitely have the basic rights, and because the school year involves a lot of remote learning, 
basic rights will be covering mm -hmm. a lot of these types of questions about how I was handling, how this is going to be handled. But if you touch base and try to wrap some of those questions together, it'd be great. Okay, I will. So um, one question is, are in-home services an option to help bridge the gap from on-site to remote learning? And would you go to the BSEA to request that accommodation? Um, yes, at-home services are indeed an option. I do not think that the BSEA is the place to start. So what the state has said is that school districts must make every effort to serve students with what they called complex and significant needs, in-person services, and that these in-person services can be at home, in the community, or at school. So I think if you have a child who's really not been able to do remote learning because of their disability, and it doesn't make sense for the child to return to school, um, then the first thing I would suggest is to reach out to the school and request a team meeting, an IEP team meeting, and at the team meeting say, hey, my child's not been able to engage in remote learning. They need in-person services. The best place for them to receive those are at home and see what the district says. If at that point the district says, no, you can't have at-home services, I'd encourage you to give our office a call. That is exactly the kind of thing that we would help with. Next question is about a child who's not been able to engage in remote learning and has regressed a lot. Yes, <laughs> a lot. That's true for a lot of kids. Um, so I'm going to, I could spend a whole hour just answering this question. So I'm going to sort of briefly summarize and I hope you all will bear with me. There is a thing called compensatory education that I briefly mentioned before. Basically what this means is that a child is entitled to what is in their IEP. And if they don't get what's in their IEP, they sort of bank those services. Um, typically the way you might see this is you have a child who's supposed to get, let's say counseling, and the counselor goes on paternity leave and they're gone for eight weeks. And then, after that, this child just misses eight weeks of counseling because the district never replaced them. So when the counselor comes back, what the district should do is give that student two counseling sessions a week to try and help make up for everything that the student has missed, try and get them back on track, try and compensate them for what they missed. That's usually how compensatory education works. But of course here with the pandemic, we're not talking about a kid who missed a little bit you know, we're not talking about a kid who missed eight counseling sessions. We're talking about thousands of students across the state who have gotten virtually no education since March. That is much harder to compensate students for. So the state has created this thing. It's called COVID Compensatory Services. And it says that districts must give students extra services and support to help get them back on track. It says that for students who really struggled with remote learning, the districts have to schedule and have IEP meetings and develop plans for these kids by December 15th. So to start the process, Shirley, what I would suggest is you reach out to your school and let them know that you want a meeting to discuss COVID compensatory services. And then at that meeting, talk about how your child has regressed and what services you think they might need to get caught up. That is how to start that process. Um, the next question from someone named P. Gent. Um, okay. So this question, I will say the short answer to this question is yes, you can request um, mediation. However, I would suggest that you call our office. I don't want to give direct legal advice on this call about a specific case because, you know, typically when you ask a lawyer for legal help, 
That conversation is privileged, meaning it's a secret. I can't tell anyone else what you've told me, but obviously we're on a big call now and a whole bunch of people can hear what I'm saying. So I don't wanna give specific advice about a specific kid, but I would encourage you, uh, my, my direct phone number is um, in this PowerPoint and I would encourage you to give us a call on Monday. Um, and then next question is, if a child with an IEP enters Boston from a different district, can Boston change the child's grade without letting the parent know? Um, typically, no. Boston is sometimes a mess. Um, but generally speaking, if a child, if any child enters Boston, regardless of whether they have an IEP, Boston should not be just changing the student's grade without talking to the parents. They probably shouldn't be changing the student's grade at all, certainly not without talking to the parents. Okay, we sort of got far afield there, but I think those are all, those are all good questions. Um, so if we go back a little bit to mediation here, um, the other thing I wanna talk about is when mediation might be helpful. First situation in which a mediation might be helpful is when the school's position is just obviously ridiculous. So when the school is just being, it's clear to you they have just lost their minds. They have no argument. Your child is obviously really having a tough time. Sometimes mediation is helpful in this situation because the mediator will tell Boston, you are being ridiculous, stop it. And sometimes that is helpful. <clears throat> The next sort of situation in which mediation might be helpful is if you think the school might work with you. So if the school is being just unbelievably difficult and they just are not listening to anything you have to say, they're not caring about your opinions or how your child is doing, I'm gonna suggest that mediation probably won't help. Um, a good time to suggest mediation is when you think there's a possibility they might work with you. Lastly, mediation helps if there is room for compromise. If there's no room for compromise, it's gonna be tough. So, you know, for example, if you want an out of district placement, you want a private placement, um, it's unlikely that you're gonna get very far in mediation. Sometimes you can, sometimes the district will say, well, you can have a private placement for a semester and we'll see how it goes. But typically big things like that are tougher to compromise on. Uh, and then lastly, I just the easiest way to request a mediation is to just call the BSEA, they have interpreters, um, so just call them and tell them you want to schedule a mediation. Okay, so that's sort of mediation basics. How to prepare. Once you've requested a mediation, the first thing I'd encourage you to do is to write down what you want um, so that you have it on a piece of paper that you can bring with you. So really think about, okay, I know my child is struggling. What do I think would really help? And make a list of everything that you want. As you make this list, don't worry about, oh, they'll never agree to that, or I'm not sure I can talk them into that. Just really write down what you want. Once you've done that, the next thing I suggest you do is write down what you're willing to compromise on and what you are not willing to compromise on. So for example, maybe what you want is you think that your child is really struggling with a learning disability and you want them to be in a smaller classroom with a rules-based reading program where they get a lot of support. Maybe you are willing to say, okay, um, you know, if they, if the district does, won't give me a smaller classroom, maybe I will be okay with pulling out with my student leaving the classroom for this rules-based reading program, that kind of thing. So think about ahead of time, okay, I'm willing to give on this, I'm not willing to give on that. Those are the first steps, making all those lists. I love lists. The next thing to do uh, is to gather evidence. The first kind of evidence are evaluations. Sometimes this is evaluations that are done by the school. 
sometimes this is a, these are evaluations that are done by outside providers. You wanna gather all your evaluations and look for evidence that what you want, the evaluators say your child needs. The next thing to do is to gather incident reports, report cards, other school records. That's the second kind of evidence. And then the third kind of evidence is your and your student's experience. So you saying, uh, you know, I have in February, my child could read every night before bed, and now they won't even pick up a book. Or in February, my kiddo was getting along with their siblings, and now they're constantly fighting, and my child can't handle ever being told no. Um, those kinds of things. That's your experience, and that's also valuable evidence. The third thing to do is to prepare an opening statement. Doesn't need to be anything fancy, nothing complicated. You don't have to write it down. But when you get to mediation, the mediator is going to ask, why did you request the mediation? What I usually suggest is go back to your list and you can just say, here's what I want. Here's why I want it. So that way, when the mediator says, why did you want mediation? You are prepared and you know what to say. And then just to talk a little bit about what to expect when you get there. Um, so mediations used to be held in sort of neutral places. Sometimes they're held at the BSEA, which is in Malden. Sometimes with Boston, they were held at the bowling building, sometimes at a library, typically not at your child's school, unless you want it to be at your school. We want it to be in a more neutral place. The way mediation works is first, the mediator will ask you, why did you ask for mediation? You'll tell them your sort of opening statement. Then after you tell them, okay, here's why I wanted mediation, the mediator will turn to the district and say, why don't you wanna do this? After you both talk, the mediator will split you up. She will put the district in a different room and then she'll come sit with you and say like, okay, give me the real deal. Like what, what else do I need to know? Tell me more about why you want this. And you can tell her sort of in confidence what, why you think this is so important. And then usually she will go to the district. Leslie, the mediator for Boston, sometimes says she calls these her come to Jesus moments with the district. She goes to the district and says, what are you doing here? You need to give the family this. They have evidence. Here's why, what can you do, what is the problem? And then the mediator will go back and forth between you and the district, trying to help you come up with some kind of agreement. The idea, the goal is that at the end of this, you have a written agreement that you and the district agree on. You can sign it right there. That is how mediation works. Let's see if we have questions about that. Um, okay. We don't really have questions about that, but we have other questions about the pandemic. Um, so one is, can you request a private placement if Boston does not have in-person learning and remote instruction is not working? So good question. Um, I think, unfortunately, again, the answer is it depends. I'll say certainly you can request it. Whether or not you have a good case for it depends on a lot of things. So it depends on um, are there additional services that Boston could give you short of a private placement that would, that would work? Um, it depends on can Boston, does Boston need to give you a private placement in order to allow, um, in order to compensate your child for everything, let's say they've regressed a lot. Maybe your child needs a private placement just in order to compensate them. Um, so certainly you can request it. The strength of the case depends on a whole bunch of facts. And, you know, if that's something that you're thinking you might want, I'd for sure encourage you to give us a call. Um, the next question is, could I request a tutor for my child provided by Boston? Um, sure, you can request it. The situations in which you would typically get a tutor are... Um, I think we're probably talking about in-person services at home. 
that's the way I would phrase that to Boston is to say, my child needs additional in-person services and the safest place for my child to get that is at home. Um, that's one way to do it. If you're looking for a tutor because your child has fallen really far behind during this period of the pandemic, then I would encourage you to ask for it as part of that COVID compensatory services that I talked about a little bit earlier. You wanna ask for a meeting by December 15th and at that meeting, this is a thing you could ask for. Uh, next question, are mediations free? They are free, thank you for asking. That is a good question. I should have thought to uh, include that. Mediations are free, there is no charge. All right. <clears throat> We are about at 2.30 and we are halfway through. So I am going to just sort of try and gloss over some hearing information um, and we will do kind of the best that we can. Uh, oh, one last question about mediations. Do you need to hire a lawyer to bring to the mediation? You do not. Typically lawyers do not attend mediations. They're supposed to be friendly. And as a group, lawyers were a pain. Um, so no, you do not need to bring a lawyer to a mediation. That's why I said over my six years of running this um, project at GBLS, I've only attended one mediation. It was a very special, weird case. Okay, let's talk about hearings for a minute. So the types of cases, the number one thing to remember about hearings is you want a hearing when you want something, you've asked for it, and the district says no. So you'll notice that most of the types of things that you can ask for hearings on are also things you can ask for mediations on. There's only two, only really one big thing that you can get a hearing on that you can't get, um, that you can't get a mediation on, and that is a manifestation determination review appeal. A manifestation determination review is when a student with an IEP is suspended for more than two days over the course of the um, over the course of an entire school year. So if you have a student with a disability who's suspended for more than 10 days over the course of a school year, you can take that as a hearing to the BSEA. Not going to get into those details right now, but that's the basics of it. Um, oh, we have one more mediation question, it looks like, which is, do you need to bring witnesses to a mediation? No, you do not. Sometimes if, if you have, uh, if your child has a therapist that they're working really closely with, who you think might be helpful, or you want to bring someone for moral support, um, you can try that. Uh, you are certainly welcome to bring it, but you don't typically need witnesses. Um, if you have written documents, you could bring those. But generally speaking, you know, the, the mediator is going to take your word for it. And we have another mediation question, which is, if the district doesn't reply to my mediation request, whom to contact for a due process hearing? Um, so an important thing to know is that don't make a mediation request to the district. You should make a mediation request by calling the BSEA. So that was that number that we put a couple slides back. Um, I'll make sure Roxy and Charlie have these slides so you can Make sure everybody sees that. But the way to request a mediation is to call the BSEA. Um, if the district says isn't responding, that's very tacky. They should respond. Um, I would say if you think you need a due process hearing, you're probably going to need an attorney or an advocate. So I would encourage you, if you think you need a due process hearing, to give us a call. Um, OK, so we talked about those due process. Uh, the, the types of cases, I'm going to touch on timelines. Basically, there are three types of timelines that hearings can happen on. There are expedited appeals. So with those, a hearing happens within 15 days. That's super fast. This is really only for that manifestation determination review appeal. So this is when a student with an IEP has been suspended for more than 10 days over the course of a school year, including the student's been expelled. Um, that can happen very, very, very quickly. Or if a school district says someone's likely to get very, very, very hurt, um, that those cases are relatively rare. 
Um, next is these accelerated hearings. This is basically the way to understand an accelerated hearing is that they are, a hearing has to happen fairly quickly. And it's about when a student is um, really, like the program is really bad. Um, so I've used this when a child is being restrained frequently, when they're failing multiple classes, it's really bad, there's a crisis. A regular hearing, a regular timeline is for everything else. This is 35 days, which you'll notice 35 days isn't that much longer than for an accelerated hearing. But importantly, regular hearings can be postponed. Accelerated hearings cannot be. So often regular hearings do not happen within 35 days. If you file for a hearing on a regular timeline, though that can take six months, a year, sometimes even longer. Um, because of postponement. Okay, um, we have one question, which is, if a student, if a school calls the police on a student with emotional or behavioral issues in their IEP, is that considered part of the suspension process? So if the police remove a student from school, that is not a suspension. Um, if, however, there is a, say, the school calls the police and tells the student, you have to wait in the office until the police arrive or something like that. That might end up constituting a suspension. But if it's just the police show up and remove the student, that's going to count as a law enforcement action, not a suspension. Okay, I am mindful that we are over time. Um, is it okay, folks, if I take like five more minutes? Go for it, Liz. All right. So I am going to try and talk about how to gather evidence for a hearing. These are things that you can do before you call a lawyer or an advocate. The first type of evidence are independent or outside evaluations. Here's how to think about this. There's basically two ways to get evaluations funded paid for in Massachusetts. Um, I guess there are three ways. The first way is to be just independently wealthy, which I'm gonna assume I'm not. I'm gonna assume if you are independently wealthy, you probably don't need my help. So we'll put that one aside. The next is uh, to have evaluations paid for by the school district. And then the third is to have evaluations paid for by your insurance, by your health insurance. So let's talk about the school district first. These are independent evaluations. The way an independent evaluation works is that once the school district does an evaluation for your child, if you don't think they did a good job, you have one year, one year from the date of that evaluation to tell the school district, I do not think you did a good job with that evaluation. I would like an outside, I would like an independent evaluation. Then you can identify your own evaluator and the district has to pay that evaluator for your child to be evaluated. So that's an, an independent evaluation where you request that the district pay for an evaluation by an evaluator of your choice within one year. A tricky thing about independent evaluations is that they, the, there's a state law that says how much school districts have to pay these independent evaluators. And there are some independent evaluators who won't take that rate. They want to be paid more. So sometimes there are evaluators that we can't use because they want more money. So you have to find an independent evaluator who takes the state rate. If you think you might want an independent evaluator and you are looking for a good one, I'm sure you've got many wonderful folks in SpedPAC who could give you some suggestions. You're also welcome to contact our office. We keep lists of evaluators who accept the state rate. So that's the first kind of evaluator is an independent. The second is an outside evaluator. These are evaluations funded by your health insurance. So this, you don't have to do anything with the school. You can call them right now today. These are places like Massachusetts General Hospital's Learning, Education, and Assessment Program, MGH-LEAP. Um, there are 
you know, neuropsychological assessments of Greater Boston, a whole bunch of places that do neuropsych outside health insurance funded evaluations. A bummer about these outside evaluations is that there are always waiting lists. They are usually at least six months long, if not longer, now they're longer. Um, so this is not gonna resolve a current crisis. That is why I usually suggest whenever I talk to someone, if your child hasn't been evaluated in the last year, just get them on some outside evaluation waiting lists because you'll be glad when it comes along. So that's the first thing. You're very often going to need an independent or an outside evaluation in order to win a hearing. If you want your child to have a one-to-one -one aid, you are very likely going to need an evaluation that says your child needs a one-to-one -one aid. If you want your child to have an out-of-district placement, you're very likely going to need an evaluator, an evaluator to say that's what they need. Um, if you want your child to have a language-based classroom, going to need an outside evaluation that says it. These evaluations are really critical. It is almost impossible to win a hearing without them. So if you are having you know, consistent problems with your child's school, I would encourage you to go get your kiddo on some lists for some evaluators. Um, and then the next type of evidence are school records. Got a list of different kinds of school records that you can get there. Note that the school has 10 calendar days to get these records to you once you request them. I don't think I have ever had Boston respond with records within the 10 days ever. Um, so if you don't get them within 10 days, that is a good thing you could file a PRS complaint about. So I'd encourage you to, once you request records, if you don't get them in 10 days, file a PRS complaint about it. The last source of evidence that I wanna talk about are notes from outside providers. Um, these are, you know, if your child has a great therapist or occupational therapist or physical therapist or um, anyone who's working with them in that kind of capacity, this can be really helpful um, in trying to build evidence. Um, okay, mindful of time. We've got a couple questions. Um, so Clayton wants to know, is it legal for the school to call the police on a child with special needs? Yes. Um, it's, of course, pedagogically horrible um, and deeply unjust, um, but there are not legal boundaries on what schools can call police for, for the most part. Um, somebody wants to know if we can have a list of outside providers. Sure. Um, I'm glad to send that to Roxanne and Charlie so they can send it along. Um, and then the last is, what do you do if your child is getting special? reading support for four years, but has made no progress in reading. Um, I would say there are two potential options there. So one option is if you think you know what your kid needs to do better in reading and the school has said no, actually, let me switch that up. If you think my child needs X in order to make progress in reading, the first step is to go ask the school for X. Then if they say no, I suggest you give us a call. If, however, you think, well, I don't really know what my child needs. I just know they're not getting it now. Um, I would suggest that you ask the school to do a reevaluation. And if you don't like that reeval, ask for an independent evaluation. And even apart from that, I would suggest asking for an outside evaluation at somewhere like MJH Leap or Children's. Um, in order to learn, okay, what is my kid really going to need? All right, that's gathering evidence. This is the last slide. So I just want to make clear, you know, when to call for help. You, I'll say you're always welcome to call us if you have any questions. We call folks back if you're not a current client within two business days. That's my email address and my direct line right there. Um, so you're always welcome to call us with questions. But if you're thinking like, I'm so frustrated, what do I do? Before going to the BSEA, the first thing I would do is fig ask for an IEP meeting and at the meeting, ask for what you want. It's always a good idea to follow up by putting your ask in writing and request your child's records. 
a good place where a lawyer can help is when you know what you want and the district has said no. Um, that is that is where we can be particularly helpful. We do basically three things. One is advice only. So sometimes folks call us and they say like, I'm just not sure what to do. And we can just give you some advice about what you can do. Um, another thing that we do is limited representation. So this is when, for example, maybe we say, we can represent you at an IEP meeting, but we're not sure we could file for a hearing, sort of a limited representation. And then lastly, our full representation. So this is when we say, yep, we're gonna take this case to take to DESE or to take to the BSDA. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you everyone for bearing with me. Um, do we have any additional questions? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, that oh, was my a, pleasure. So and that was a lot of comments are in the thing too. They're saying yes. So I think all the questions were answered actually. So okay, great. Hearing this, and once we get the slides, we will post them on the website and also the list of the neuro sure. evaluators so that everyone has access to them. So we thank you, and that is the end of our lovely meeting. Everyone, All right, good. have a great day. Thanks, folks.